Talking about uh, demystifying CICD, what that what you know CICD means, why it matters, uh, and you know some simple ways uh, or some you know some good steps to kind of get started if you aren't already using it within your uh, development lifecycle, uh, within your teams, within your company, whatnot. Um, another alternate title for this would be making sense of CICD in my current software development workflow, or how to uh, confound. Uh, traditional uh, software development. I don't know, we're, we're still workshopping that third title. All right, so uh, imagine uh, you're getting ready to, to release, uh, release something, some new software, um, and uh, you know, you're ready to, ready to get it going, ready to hit that big button. Uh, by the way, this is audience participation. You'll see why in a second. Um, and you kind of press the big red button Wow, when I said audience participation, I didn't mean two people participate from that side of the room. Okay, so we're gonna go back. You ready to press the big red button? Wow, that was so good, thank you. Yes, so you, you, you click the button and you just kind of breathe. You kind of take a big breath. Hope it works, generally. Uh, and silence, you, you're not really sure. Uh, do you, you know, sweat it out, uh, wait to see if something blows up? Uh, or do you pack everything up, go home, and just enjoy your weekend? I don't know about you, uh, but B does seem more appealing to me. Uh, but how are you going to know that nothing goes wrong? It all boils, boils down to your automation. From software to, you know, processes uh, to manufacturing to, yes, even out agriculture. What, and while we're not going to talk about agriculture today, uh, I do like to compare software develop, uh, delivery life cycles to kind of growing crops. Uh, you constantly have to be on top of, of that whole process. Um, of course, there's always the chance of machines misbehaving. Uh, and while you know, I'm pretty certain it's not going to end up like this, where we are uh, kind of robot, ending up with robot dinosaurs taking over the world, we're you know, in a brutal fight to the end with that. Um, after the last year, I think we can all agree that anything's possible, uh, but automation in, um, in, in our processes, a malfunction there can just as much ruin your crops as it can mess up your software process. Reality is that it's, it's never really the machine's fault. Uh, it's pretty much always us in one way or another. Every software failure is rooted in a human error. So with that, I'm Jeremy Nies. Uh, I'm director of DevRel uh, at CircleCI. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking uh, about and, and kind of diving into CICD um, and, and hopefully kind of making it easy for you to get a handle on it if you're not really sure uh, and kind of use it as a, that jumping off point to implementing it, like I said, in, uh, into your company, your organization, your projects, whatnot. Um, and so, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into some of these terms. Uh, you can find me at those places. Um, all right, so DevOps, I and mean, we've all, I'm sure all of us have heard the term DevOps, uh, probably don't need a show of hands, probably all heard of it. But DevOps is a, uh, it's a set of practices that combine software development, so that's the dev part, uh, and then the information technology operations, which would be the ops part, that's why they put them together, DevOps, uh, which aims to kind of shorten the system development lifecycle and provide continuous delivery with high software quality. So the key pieces of the DevOps lifecycle starts with planning. You know, it's that initial plan that you're you know, putting together around the type of application you need to develop, uh, kind of building that rough picture uh, regarding the, the development process itself. And then you jump into the code. Uh, that's the, you know, of course, that's the application per the you know, client or per the, um, the department's uh, requirements. And, and with that plan, you've already made in the initial step. The build, okay, so that's building the application, performing the integration of various codes that you've put together uh, in that previous step. This all kind of continues to build on each other. Testing, okay, that's, that's, the, that's the heart of the, um, the application itself. You're testing the application, 
to make sure that you, whatever you've built so far works, um, and then you rebuild the application if necessary. Um, and then uh, if you succeed in that test phase, then it's time to release that application in, into you know, live or production or whatever you might call your, your rollout systems. Operate, you know, the operation. That's where you know, the, the code itself is operating the way it's supposed to. And then you're deploying it. You're getting that code into an environment for further usage. Uh, you know, it's performed in you know, such a manner that any changes that you make uh, should not affect the functioning of uh, the application or the website. So as you're rolling it out, boom, everything should just appear and should just continue working like it did before, ideally. Again, back to the hopefully nothing blows up. And then monitoring. Uh, you're monitoring the performance of the application per the requirements of whatever you were building. You're keeping a note on the performance of it, making sure it's doing the way it's, uh, it's supposed to be performing. Uh, and you're making any modifications necessary to kind of satisfy the client or satisfy the, you know, um, whoever's requesting this, the business requirements. And then if it doesn't reach, you know, stand up to the mark, then you're making the cha changes and kind of kicking things back up again. So CICD itself is rooted in agile methodology. Uh, and it embodies the culture of a team or, you know, the company's commitment to automating uh, and the DevOps principles, generally containing a set of operating principles uh, and a collection of practices which enable dev teams to release uh, quality code more frequently and reliably. That's the core crux of, of CICD, why you wanted to have that. The term fail fast is a, is a term that's, uh, it's, it's still there, <laughs> fail fast. Uh, it is an important one here, um, and it gives development teams uh, the ability to know when stuff's broken. Can you all still hear me? Okay, all of a sudden seem like went down. Um, yeah, so we kind of make sure that people know when it's, when it's, when it's broken, and the, the ability to have that quickly uh, is invaluable for development teams. Um, quickly fixing those issues, resubmitting fixes, delivering stable code constantly. That's kind of the core tenet of what CICD is. Now, it's important now to, to kind of really understand where we've come from, where CICD really kind of the principles came from. So all the way back in 1991, um, some of us were alive, others were not. Um, it's uh, Grady Booch, uh, who was a, um, he was one of the originators of the object-oriented uh, way of programming, um, and he also was the founder of UML. Uh, he first proposed the idea of CI um, in a book uh, in 1991 called Object-Oriented Analysis and Design with Applications. His method advocated for a more frequent use of classes and objects in programming, in order to simplify the design. His version of CI, CI itself didn't really suggest releasing multiple times per day though. It was just a, an idea of being able to, to get those changes in. In 97, uh, along came an idea which was built on, uh, built on that Booch method, which we'll call it, uh, and it advocated for releasing multiple times per day. This was called extreme programming and it really kind of changed the game. Um, how many remember when this came out or have heard about, yeah, it just, it really, it changed, changed the game. The idea of it and the crux of it was taking already standardized concepts and paradigms for writing and releasing software and then going like way further with those, uh, those concepts to the extreme, hence extreme. And it's kind of brought on shorter release cycles uh, in extensive code reviews, pair programming, unit testing, acceptance testing. Those were all things that kind of started to be boiled in that really didn't, as a, as a principle, exist prior to this. Um, and they're all standard now because of uh, extreme programming. I had my notes here, XP, and I was like, no, it's not Windows XP, it's experiment. Uh, extreme programming. So from here we got, you know, from built off of there, we got more and more methodologies uh, that built on those works like Scrum uh, and Kanban, those all kind of came out of this idea of extreme programming. Uh, and they all had one goal in mind, make it easier to write clearer, higher quality code, and then get it out to users. And while we recognize uh, that all of this needed to happen, we didn't, didn't really have the tools to make it happen at, at that point. And then at least not easily. So uh, the first open source tool to make continuous integration easier to achieve appeared in 2001 with 
uh, the release of something called cruise control. How many have heard of, heard of cruise control? Okay. Um, compared to what we see today, it was very, uh, very primitive uh, and prehistoric in, in terms of software uh, delivery now. Um, but it was a game changer 20, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and people still actually use it today, believe it or not. Uh, it still exists. If you go out and look, uh, the source for it is still out there and people still have it, have it deployed. Um, and it wasn't revolutionary uh, when it was released because for the time there, there was a system that could be installed um, and stood, I'm sorry, it was revolutionary because now you could have a system that you could stand up on your own hardware uh, and manage it and now automate the management of builds, uh, allowing you know, the releasing of software to happen way more quickly than, than happened and even would integrate with your IDE, whatever you were using. So depending on that IDE, if you were using uh, um, like uh, Eclipse, then you would have your own, you know, you're doing Java code, so you'd have your own specific uh, variant of cruise control specifically for Java. Uh, same thing for, you know, Ruby, so on and so forth. And then eventually it was overtaken by Jenkins. Jenkins popped around um, and Jenkins is, is still, still very widely used today. Uh, and, and it does support a ton of different languages. Uh, it can be made to do just about anything you want it to. Uh, and it has an enormous community around it. So you know, if you're running into you know, any difficulties, chances are someone else probably has too over the, the time it's been out there. Uh, and so you have that, that community to draw from. And that's still attractive to a lot of people. Um, and it's the upside of using something that's been around for a long time. Uh, it is stable. Uh, it is relatively secure. And it still is pretty popular. Uh, the downside is that you know, the way we build software now um, and the way we deploy it is very much, uh, and the, even the way we use software is changing very much cloud driven. Um, and so, you know, Jenkins is kind of starting to show its age, uh, primarily in the, the need to spin up your own infrastructure uh, and have your own teams to support it, which can be, you know, challenging depending on the company uh, and can even be more, not as cost effective as, as using something in the cloud. So, and this is just mentioned, I work for Circle CI, so I'm saying that before I mention the slide. We have cloud services like ours. There's others out there as well. Um, in fact, there's even a Jenkins X, which is kind of Jenkins in the cloud um, with all the same kind of issues that Jenkins is uh, and the ad advantages that Jenkins gives you um, is also in the cloud. Stuff like us, uh, GitHub has GitHub Actions. They have a piece of GitHub Actions that also does CI. Um, but all these cloud services are built so that you don't have to babysit your whole CI process your service or your infrastructure, and it said, instead kind of lets you get back to the business of, uh, of writing software. Uh, the supporting different, you know, uh, different languages, lots of them that are out there, different build environments, um, and they already know how to deal with systems like Docker and Kubernetes. You don't have to learn about it, they already support it. So it's already kind of built into how you're wanting to deploy, build and deploy software. And probably already have deploy, you know, things that can help you handle deployments, um, observability, analytics, all of that. So using a cloud service is, is gonna be much more flexible for you uh, and also lower maintenance as well. So many years ago, uh, thankfully, um, Microsoft's Visual Source Safe attempted to keep you uh, from overwriting code that others were working on. How many have used Microsoft's Source Safe or re at least remember the bane of existence that it, that was? Um, which the way that the idea of it was great in theory, um, but let me just uh, give an example of kind of how things would, would happen with SourceSafe. You'd be working on some code, you've pulled it down, uh, you have a task that you need to edit it, you know, one file. You go to edit that file and the way what SourceSafe would do is it would lock that file and not let anyone else use it and you would then develop on it when you were done, you'd push it back and it would be, it'd be great, it'd unlock it. Um, However, you find out that that one file was locked for some reason by another developer in your company. So you go to find that developer. You realize they're sitting over in some area of the building. You go over there, find out they're not there. Come to find out they're on vacation for two weeks. And the only way to get that unlocked is to either have them do it or to get IT to 
have a lot of fun with the management of that software. And potentially, if they might have changed something, break all of their changes and have to start over. That was a pretty repeatable challenge uh, with, with Visual Source Safe. Um, and the uh, came up with a lot of loss of productivity, at least you know, my experience with, with that, I'm sure that was replicated by a lot of you. But there is a better way. So the way, uh, as we've, we've kind of built with, with CICD now, is that you can work on your software, you can pull down, uh, it's very similar, I mean, it's the same idea that we have now with you know, the Git flow process, uh, that you can pull down your, your code, you can work on that branch, or you can work on the fork, whatever it might be within your, your normal, um, workflow in, in your teams, and you can make your changes, you can push them up, have them built, have them tested to make sure all of that works, and someone else can be doing the same thing, and when you have it, you can pull it all together, as opposed to having to check out one file and have one person, um, that's, not, that's not good software flow. So CICD provides the ability to have uh, multiple things happening all at once, test it, build it, make sure it's ready before it gets rolled into mainline. All right, so CI, uh, the definition here, uh, the practice of merging all uh, developers working copies to a shared code repository. Pretty simple definition. Uh, so kind of in practice, what CI gives you, uh, if you have a repo on GitHub, you have 10 developers, all 10 of those developers are gonna branch from the shared, same co shared code base. Uh, they're gonna have an, kind of an individual silo uh, based on their own development environment on their machine. As they're writing code, they're continuously pushing that code up into the shared code base. Uh, and as they're writing it, um, you know, the reason, reason, the reason for doing all, all that is that sometimes when we write code, it can take us a week uh, to kind of to, to figure out what's, uh, to get done what our, our tasks are. Um, and can take us a week, two weeks. Uh, and so whatever that time frame is, it means that if you're, you're developing, you have developers that are in isolation, uh, the rest of your team doesn't really know what's happening until those changes get pushed up into the upstream, the repo itself. And so, um, you know, they can pull those down, see what's going on, and by doing this, in the, the continuous integration piece, uh, the team is more informed about what each other's code is and how it's performing, uh, in, instead of having code all over the place, and then trying to, you know, you don't even know what the left hand, right hand is doing. You get everything all integrated in, it can be tested and you know it's working. So getting that merged often. So running automated tests uh, to validate the builds. So as developers are merging uh, code base changes often, we want to run automated tests, you know, uh, automated tests to validate those builds. So as you're pushing your code base um, upstream, uh, we're you know, definitely inclined to start running these automated tests as that happens to ensure the code that you're pushing is, is actually of quality. And the importance here is testing. Again, only tested code is integrated into the, into the code base. And changes frequently get merged into uh, release branches. Um, and the reason for this is that you know, continuous integration gets you at a speed in a sense that once you write some code, you push it, uh, upstream automation is gonna take over and it then validates all those builds ensuring that you're only pushing again quality code. The goal here is quality code into production code base, production branches. You know it's good because it's past your testing. Now continuous deployment is basically that automation piece. Uh, it's the practice of automatically deploying new software releases to target environments. The overall chain of processes generally it's called a pipeline. You kind of heard that, um, probably heard that, that. That helps us with kind of releasing our software faster uh, by automatically getting source code changes, running them through the building, testing, packaging, and other related operations to produce a release. The goals of CD in this case are you know, taking from that quality code and producing software releases uh, that are, you know, it's generally automated um, and it's, it's efficient. Uh, it's reliable, it's reproducible, so it's not just something you do once, it's something that will continue to happen. Uh, and then verification of the quality uh, through continuous testing. That's not, a, not really a term, you know, the C, it's not a CT piece, but it probably should be. We should be doing continuous testing. Uh, again, I'm, testing is gonna be a big, big piece here. 
Uh, in most cases, it also means you're delivering smarter uh, and knowing risks to your release uh, processes themselves. And then the code and the software uh, being released should be at a higher quality. That's really the goal here, and that's if you're doing these things, that's what, that's what you're getting to. And then by using these the continuous delivery mechanisms, um, you're actually lowering your costs for time for your developers. Uh, you know, your costs for actual billable items, such as time spent delivering software, uh, to multiple infrastructures like staging, uh, QA and production. You're, you're able to, I'm not saying eliminate all of those, but you're able to simplify a lot of your processes uh, because you're doing, you're automating that and you're not having to spin something up uh, to take care of you know, some things that you could automate. So much has changed in the way uh, that developers build and ship code. Uh, we've you know, kind of, I'd like to say we've grown as an industry from back in the, uh, you know, the early 90s with the Booch method. Um, in implementing CICD, you're really implementing, implementing the practices and principles which aren't really, it's not really about the tooling. Um, you can, there's multiple tools out there that can all kind of accomplish the same thing. Um, it's, it's important though that you and your team sit down and decide how you're gonna implement those CICD practices and principles. And then you figure out what tool does best for that. CICD aims to kind of break down the walls uh, between dev and ops, which is really what DevOps itself is about, is breaking down those walls and getting everyone on the same page working together. It's kind of like not only you get everybody on the same bus and not just getting on the same seat on that bus, but it's the same, but you go in the same direction. And that's one of the core pieces of, of uh, DevOps and you know, ultimately CICD. Uh, and you don't have to implement CICD all at once. Uh, it can be, you know, there's, there's things, it's in, in and of itself, it can be iterative. You can do little small pieces until you've, you've really gotten it there. The systems and tech that are currently in place in your organization combined with the culture, which in itself might, uh, might need to be reformed until you're able to really, uh, as an organization, implement these practices. So it's got to be kind of often iterative uh, and that's going to, all those pieces are going to dramatically influence kind of the customization that you're going to need to implement in order to get CICD in your organization. Now, of course, there are benefits. Uh, the fundamental tenet of continuous integration really is quite simple. Uh, commit and integrate your code often, daily at a minimum. Uh, such a small change in your software development process can yield some big results. And here's just a, you know, a few of these using this development strategy. Um, you're able to you know, improve uh, team productivity and, and efficiency, accelerate speed to market, identify you know, your product market fit. Imagine being able to uh, quickly see how well you're, whatever you're trying to develop is, makes sense to your, um, your organization or to your customers by being able to iterate really quickly uh, changes and new features. Um, you can also, re, you know, again, release higher quality, more stable products, uh, increase customer satisfaction. You can even keep, dev, keep devs happy and shipping code. I know, devs happy. What's that about? Uh, you, and you may kind of be thinking, you know, how do these, how do these benefits really um, come from such a, a simple change in your workflow? And I use simple kind of tongue in cheek because it may be, like I said earlier, it may be a big change for your organization, but it is, it is a change. Um, when you're committing more often, you are able to identify and resolve issues, uh, merge conflicts, you know, all of those things earlier, uh, or you can avoid them altogether. Um, so instead of writing thousands of lines of code, finding an error that, you know, in, you know after you've written all of that, if you're able to iterate quickly and work on a smaller, subsection of code, get it up there, make sure it's testing. Maybe you're only writing 100 lines of code. It's a whole lot easier to find an error in 100 lines of code than thousands of lines of code. Um, so finding those bugs becomes really an errand of, you know, a few minutes as opposed to, you know, a few hours or more, which again is going to lead to, lead to team productivity uh, and, you know, helps developers ship working code more quickly, which they really like to do. Shipping, uh, shipping new features quickly really means increasing the, your speed to market. I talked earlier about if you could get things out to your customers quicker, you would want to do that. Um, and 
it gives you a competitive edge. The first one being you're, you're able to get you know, access, like I said, to new features faster. Uh, hopefully that's gonna lead to higher customer satisfaction. You're also you're able to get kind of a faster return on the investment um, from those new features as opposed to long uh, build cycles or long release cycles that we've seen in, in the past. When I worked at uh, Sprint for 11 years, uh, it was not uncommon to have projects that would take two years to deliver a new billing system. And by the time we deploy the new billing system, we were already working on the new project to deploy the new billing system. That, that was the old way of doing releases. Uh, and that was building it from scratch. That wasn't like deploying some other system. That was building things from scratch. Um, so rather than kind of waiting for that next milestone to release code, uh, you can deliver value as soon as that new feature is ready for, uh, for the market. All right, so with all of that out of the way, I'm going to talk a little bit about implementation of CICD into your, um, into your you know, company, into your kind of processes. It's important to get uh, a continuous integration pipeline set up as early as possible in that development uh, development of your application. Once tests are added to your CI pipeline, you can continue to innovate, build with confidence, knowing you can't, you can't merge code uh, to main that doesn't pass your tests, which that's, again comes back to the quality of your code. That's extremely important here. Automating your software's build, test, uh, and deployment is important to getting back to, uh, to work building the features that customers really want um, and that they care about the most and that you're able to you know, build the value for your um, application, your website, whatever it is you're building. So the first thing here is you've got to make sure that everybody, when you're implementing CICD, uh, everybody's on the same page um, with respect to what you're trying to achieve by adding this new, new process, uh, this new tool. Uh, there's nothing, nothing worse than kind of reading from uh, different playbooks on how to do a task. Uh, it, so it, it's going to require that everybody in the organization knows uh, what you're doing what the processes are, why you're doing it, and how, it, how to go about their day using uh, CICD in their, in their, now their new development process or adding it into their development process. Uh, it's important to always start small. Um, continuous integration is not just about implementing that new tool, it's about changing how the development team works. Um, and it's a new mindset. So. You know, making culture changes in an organization, um, I'm sure all of us have, have been a part of that in one way or another. It's not easy. It doesn't just, you know, those that want to make the changes like to think, snap a finger, boom, now everybody's on the same page. It doesn't work that way. It takes time. Uh, so it's important to start small. Uh, the best way to get started with that continuous integration is that small iterative piece. Uh, don't try to make the entire organization, uh, you know, into this model DevOps team overnight. Um, you will, you're going to fail every time. Give it a day or two. Instead, kind of make process changes um, on one team. You know, that's one example of just take one team in your organization. Have them be the, kind of that model. Um, see if they work with, see if it works. Um, see if, you know, any improvements need to be made and then move incrementally into other teams. Um, how many have read the books from Gene Kim? Um, the... Uh, you, the, the Phoenix Project and then the uni, Unicorn, I think was the second one, Unicorn Project, talks about that. About, and I highly, if you have not read those, I, I could not recommend those, those two books um, any, <laughs> any more than, than I just did. Uh, Phoenix Project, the first one. Phoenix Project is the one that kind of sets the stage uh, about how do you get a lot of these DevOps principles in? How do you take just one small team and build processes around it to where your organization follows suit. And then uh, the Unicorn Project kind of takes it to the, the ops side. The first side was kind of the devs, the, it now builds on the ops. All right, um, one other, one key piece there is, um, one, it, it, I can't stress enough, start small. Uh, it is important because if, if you try and push everybody kicking and screaming to try a new process, uh, it's, it's not going to work. Um, and do what works for you. You know, I said don't try and be the model DevOps, DevOps organization like overnight. Um, it may not be the, you know, DevOps as a whole may not be the right solution for your um, organization 
overall. Like pieces of it might be. Uh, so like, you know, some companies have been successful for a long time without DevOps. Doesn't mean that we need to change immediately. Um, and, you know, for example, if, if confidentiality is a big part of, you know, your tool or the, your development and whatever you're doing, maybe it's in the government or maybe it's finance or something, having an iterative process that's constantly adding new features that your competitors might be able to see, that might not be the best thing for the business. But you can still implement these processes internally until you're ready to get to a larger audience. And if, uh, that's where things like progressive delivery can come in, where you're really kind of taking subsets and rolling things out, but you're still using continuous integration uh, as a core to your development process. Uh, it's important to always measure. Um, start with a baseline. Uh, before you start any improvement, it's important to kind of get accurate metrics for where you currently are. Um, so like, you know that your dev cycles take X amount of time, use that as your baseline, and then look to make small improvements, see where as you add, how much it improves, uh, and then start doing your measurements. Start setting your you know, OKRs, your KPIs, instead of just jumping in and say, hey, we wanna, we think we can improve 25% when you don't even know where your, your baseline is. You gotta figure that out first. Um, and then after a small amount of time, you're able to see whether whatever you've been doing has been effective, and then you're able to then set better targets. Um, so some of the benchmarks that we've seen, and there's an entire report um, that we've been working on, uh, these are the benchmarks that we've identified for high-performing CI teams. Um, so throughput is, you know, you're, you're pushing code as you know, often as you can. Uh, duration, duration of your builds are less than 10 minutes. Uh, success rate for those is going to be more than 90% for those, those builds. Uh, and then the mean time to recovery is, you know, less than an hour. That's for high-performing teams. Is everybody going to be this on day one? Probably not. And that's okay. Um, the, I go back to what I said earlier, fail fast. It's okay to, to make, have that failure. It's okay to not hit this. But these are some good um, stats to kind of get you, get you up to that. Um, all right, better CICD practices. Um, so fostering a rigorous testing culture uh, is the most important element that a company needs for successful uh, continuous integration. In order to uh, confidently in integrate new code into the mainline, uh, the team has to have the confidence that the code that they've been building is sound. Um, engineers should write tests as each feature is being developed. I come back to that testing. That's important. Um, at Circle CI, we run tests on any new code that's committed, and our system is then going to alert uh, the developer if they have a successful green build or if they need to fix issues because the build was red. Without tests, green builds are meaningless. <laughs> if you don't have a test in there, you're always going to get a green. That's not going to tell. That that doesn't tell you anything. That's why it's, it's okay to have those red builds. Uh, it's how quickly you get to the green build that's important, but it's okay to have a red build because that's telling you that you've got something to fix. Um, it's better for you to find it than to have your customers find it. So ideally the team is you know, using some form of automated testing, um, though it's not a requirement, but they need to have some, testing's gotta be happening. Um, QA services like Rainforest QA, uh, can, can be integrated into that whole uh, continuous integration process as well to make sure that you are continuing to, to test. Uh, and then to support that rigorous testing culture that I hope you are implementing, it's important the testing environment is going to mirror the production environment. Uh, otherwise, you have no guarantee that what you're testing is going to work in production. This means the testing environment should use, I mean, should, hopefully it should go without saying, should use the same version of the database, uh, same web server configuration, um, same artifacts, all of those things have to be in place in order for you to get good testing uh, so that when you're deploying, you're getting good results. Uh, another better practice for software development uh, is pairing during coding. We talked about that earlier of how that was kind of inter introduced. Um, more complex pieces of functionality when you're doing it in pairs, uh, 
they can discuss that architecture approach before a single line of code is even written. Um, and then before any code is merged in production, another developer is reviewing that code. This helps ensure that coding best practices are followed um, and that the code does not conflict with existing code. Again, this comes back to the, the importance of pushing quality code. And then finally, kind of a, 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 when we're talking about better CICD practices, ensure the entire software development pipeline is fast and efficient. Um, the deploy workflow, deploy workflow itself should also be automated. Um, when you auto automate that deploy workflow, uh, the team gets finished code to production more quickly. They can get it, they get it pushed up, they can go work on something else while the deployment takes off. So some are, you know, streamlining the deploy wherever you can is important. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of services like Netlify, Vercel. Uh, they help you with that streamlining. You connect it uh, to your repos. And as you're, when you're ready to build, uh, you've done your testing, you do your building, they do the deploying, and you can get back to the service of, of writing code. Uh, if you haven't, uh, Heroku does, you know, does a lot of the same. There's a lot of services out there that all, all do this. So if you're not already doing this, uh, definitely look into services like this. And then uh, I talked about kind of a, a report uh, that we've done. Um, the study of DevOps reports have been around for a while. Uh, we also did one that was a um, software delivery, um, state of software delivery report that you can find here. Um, it's, a, it's the full report that talks about high-performing uh, teams, how to you know, implement and the importance of, of high-performing teams based on 60, 60 million, I want to say it's 60 million um, workflows, uh, builds, sorry, 60 million builds over a span of time, over a year, that we were able to look and see how teams are performing. Made this free uh, out there. You don't have to sign up for anything to get the report. Um, you can click the download button. If you want to sign up, great, but you don't have to. Uh, but I highly recommend this report. Um, the, the long and short of it is 2009 was the first year we did it. I'm sorry, 2019. 2009 was a long time. 2019. Uh, and had some really good data around, you know, like I said, high-performing teams. And then the pandemic hit and changed the entire landscape of how teams were performing. Uh, and because we sit at the kind of crux of where teams are doing their work and pushing builds and, and working with the code, um, we were able to look at that data and see what changed with the pandemic um, and how teams were performing as people went remote prim primarily. Uh, and so... Um, highly recommend the report. The new one is coming out in January, February timeframe, so that, that is another good opportunity to see, you know, as we've come out of the pandemic to some extent, or are coming out of it, is software development changing? Are people going back to the way we used to do things, or are they starting to learn and becoming more high performing? Um, so definitely, definitely check that out. The last thing here is I know this kind of goes against a little bit of what I said earlier, but don't try to automate everything. Um, it's, you know, at least not all at once. Uh, one misconception about DevOps is that, you know, all the infrastructure provisioning and the configuration management and all those things have to be done automatically. Um, that's kind of referred to as like infrastructure as code. And I think infrastructure as code is important. Uh, there's services out there that are doing great work. Um, but some things work better when they are done manually. Uh, automation is not really the solution for everything, but sometimes you have to start the manual way to figure out what works and where you, know, where you can automate it. But there's some things you maybe just don't, don't want to have automated. Um, a great way to get started, uh, seeing how this could work, uh, is really kind of starting with a proof of concept. Like I said earlier, take a team, see, start putting these principles into play. Um, you know, making sure you get the rigorous testing practice. Ideally, you're using automated tests, um, consistent software environments from testing to production, um, train on continuous integration practices continually, um, and then, you know, use reports to measure those key metrics. Once your teams start committing regularly uh, and in small increments, they'll see how much easier it is uh, to be responsive to bugs. Um, and as they resolve those bugs faster, you know, they're going to be able to deliver features even faster. So this will give your team the momentum uh, to hopefully uh, integrate 
um, continuous integration across your uh, uh, across your workflows, across your organization. Uh, so with that, thank you. Um, would love feedback. Also, if you want swag, I didn't bring any other than a bunch of stickers at the registration desk. Um, but uh, if you want some swag, a t-shirt or whatnot, uh, would love to get feedback from you on, on this. Or if you have any questions also around uh, CICD, if you go to uh, circle.ci slash Jeremy, um, you can uh, fill out a nice little form and I will get back with you uh, in any way there. And you can also find me on all of those different places. Uh, I'm primarily on Twitter, probably more than I should, but hey. Uh, and with that, thank you. Any questions? I'm open to questions. We have, we have a few more minutes. Any questions? Yeah. yeah on the performance things like uh, when you talk about uh, deployment time, it includes testing, uh, like unit testing and automation testing. Uh, let's see here. So let me. There? Yeah, that's right. Okay. On the duration, it includes also the testing and like end to end testing and unit testing, or it's just doing the, like, like the building. So that's going to be, it, it would be the whole thing. So the, if you're thinking about your, your, uh, your build, testing, that's going to have all of the testing pieces. Um, there are some, uh, you know, we've seen, we've seen sometimes it takes um, like 15 seconds. I think it was like, like there was like 5% of all builds in 2020 um, were uh, like under 12 seconds, I think is what it was, which that seems short, uh, which, okay, yeah. But if you think about it, like, when you look at 5% of, like, I think it's 60 million, that's, that's a lot of builds. That's like 550 or 600,000 builds are completing in, like, 15 seconds or less. So there are some things you can do in that short amount of time. The mean of that data was really more around that five to 10 minute mark from when you push your code to where it gets a, hopefully a green status. So if you have better, you know, paralyzed, parallelized, I can never get that word right, uh, builds where you're doing multiple testing things happening at once, that can help speed up those pipelines uh, and get to a build a green status quicker. Um, the ideal is in that less than 10 minutes. Uh, as long as you're doing testing and it's valuable testing and not just, you know, as long as it's valuable testing, I'm going to go into all the other reasons why it wouldn't be. Um, if it takes more than 10 minutes, that's fine. The important is getting valuable testing going um, and getting, and, and it not just be something that will get the build to pass quick, quicker. That's why I say it's important with your metrics around builds for your development teams to not dwell on the, hey, let's do five builds a day, or you know, not to focus on that, it's to focus on the ones that show the value of, of it. So having, um, having more success, a better success rate on your, on your um, main branch, as opposed to like your feature branches, like not, don't care about your feature branches, because that's where you're doing your development. It's okay if those you know, have a low success rate, but you want a higher success rate on your main bill, on your production bills. So it's understanding how your teams work. That's why I say it's important to set like that baseline of how you're working now and then make iterative changes to get better. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you see here that you use uh, develop off the main versus having feature branches succeeding better? So yes, so that's, that's in the report. Uh, the, short, the short answer of that is we saw the um, success rates on main branches, production branches, being much higher. Um, and we saw that as a change kind of coming out of 2019 and 2020. But at the same time, we saw the feature branch success rates going down, 
which shows that people are on the feature branches. That's more that testing of the red to green, red to green. I'm, I'm working on a new build. I want to see a new feature, make sure it works. Okay, now it's green. Now I'm pushing it over. We saw, we saw more higher success rates on your production branches than on the feature branches. Yeah. Was that your question? Okay. I think so, uh, um, so if you're, people are using developing off of main uh, a lot, uh, other than feature flags, what are they doing to try and control what gets out to the public and, and what stays hidden until it's ready? Primarily, it's, it's uh, either controlled releases where they're just uh, releasing, they, they get it to main, but they don't run their deploy steps. Uh, until they've reached a certain set of, you know, maybe then until they finally get all the features they want, or they're using feature flags. Uh, progressive delivery as a concept uh, very much addresses that, of just continuing to get things out uh, to your testing so you can get those results and then open up the control, uh, control group as you go. Yeah? Any other questions? Do your report have anything about book coverage? I'm sure that you can't open source of everybody's. So, code coverage as in? As in, you said that the main uh, success rate went up and the feature went down. Maybe that's because code coverage increased in the feature branches. Oh, gotcha. But. We don't have the, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say, I, I would have to go look. Um, I can, I can do some check-in, but I, I would definitely would encourage the report just to have a quick, quick read of it. I do, something's telling me there's an answer to that, and I, I, I don't recall it. Yeah. Uh, love, to, love to chat with you afterwards, to see, see if, you know, I could probably grab the report real quick and see what I pop in there. There was another question, I think, over here. Trying to put you all on the spot, but no, nobody bit. Uh, any other questions? Cool. All right. Uh, again, uh, welcome. Any feedback? And, and again, if you want some swag, t-shirts, uh, all that fun stuff, uh, circle.ci/jeremy. All right. Thank you. <laughs>